Good morning, church. I am blessed to be able to see you this morning. Amen. We're blessed to gather together. We're blessed to have veterans, those who would give it up for us. We are blessed, a blessed nation, a blessed people. And we do need to make sure we honor the veterans as they deserve. Uh, we could share so many stories about what they've gone through, different ones, uh, the battles, giving it all up. And we do need to stop and consider that once in a while and be grateful and thankful. And be sure to thank your vets, your veterans. Uh, when you see them and you get those opportunities. Amen. Veterans have walked the road. I want to switch a little bit and uh, get you to think maybe about Christian veterans. Um, there are probably quite a few in here who have been saved a long time. More than five years, more than 10 years, more than 20 years, and lots more than that for some others. Saved a long time. In other words, uh, we should have quite a few Christian veterans here in the group today. Would you agree? Mm hmm. And if you were to look to see in the scriptures, what a Christian veteran is like, I think you'll find the description laid out very well in the Sermon on the Mount. That's starting at Matthew chapter 5, going through chapter 7. Jesus describes what a Christian is like, and he brings up all these areas of life. For example, he says uh, his followers are to be salt and light in the earth. He, he teaches how his followers uh, handle anger. He teaches about adultery and where his followers are uh, as, as that uh, topic is brought up. He teaches about divorce and he shows what a, what a believer in him uh, how they will look at divorce. He talks about revenge and what a veteran Christian, how they would handle the temptation to revenge. He te teaches about love for enemies, for the veteran Christian, giving to the needy, prayer and fasting, how to handle your money and possessions, not judging others in a condemning way. He teaches all of this and more in the Sermon on the Mount. I believe there he is describing a veteran Christian. <clears throat> and then he closes that teaching with a teaching about the house that's built upon the solid rock. Chapter 7, starting at verse 24. Now, all of that teaching, describing the veteran Christian, closed with this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for hearing us through Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for growing us. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for not giving up on us. We just thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we have through you and your Son. And we acknowledge we have not arrived yet, Lord. There's a ways to go. And we want to finish faithfully. And we want to be faithful along the way. So, Lord, give us what we need today. Help us to hear, Lord, what you're saying to us today. Today, Lord, continue to use your word uh, to change us and to make us Christian veterans. Now, please anoint this teacher. Help me to be faithful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the believer said, Amen. Amen. So these teachings on the mount close with this very familiar passage that we are to build our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And if we will do that, build our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ, we will live forever. Isn't that the promise? In fact, if we look across the United States, we'll find and, and the, the statistics or the figures don't always agree, but somewhere between 60 to 75 percent of the people, of all the people in the United States, says, say that they believe in Jesus Christ. Now, why do they, that many people say that? Because I would guess they want to live forever. They want to go to heaven. They don't want to go to hell, right? So they, they acknowledge, they believe in Jesus, that He's real, that He was on the earth. <clears throat> but are all these people following the teachings of Jesus? Are all these people, this 60 to 75 percent of the people across the USA, are they, do they even know what Jesus says? And they are, apply, are they applying his teachings to the areas of their lives? Well, if we look at uh, just before this teaching about building your house upon the rock, Jesus hit one other topic. I'd like to uh, go to that one. It's verse. 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who calls Jesus Lord or calls Jesus God is going into heaven. Not everyone who joins the church is going to go to heaven. Not everyone who shows up on Sundays is going to go to heaven. Not everyone who is baptized is going to go to heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. When Jesus truly comes into a heart, someone really sorry for their sins, invites him into their lives, then he will change them. You are different from who you used to be before you invited Jesus into your heart. Amen? In fact, most of you are a lot different from who you were before you invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord, before you started naming His name. Amen. I like the difference in you. <laughs> Becky likes the difference in me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 22. On Judgment Day, that's a pretty heavy day, isn't it? Coming up. 
many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Did you catch that? When judgment day comes around, great numbers will call Jesus Lord. They will say, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed very, very many miracles in your name. Boy, they're naming the name of Jesus a lot. In fact, this sounds like a pretty good group to have in a church, doesn't it? Performing miracles and prophesying. And they sound like good church members, don't they? But I will reply, verse 23, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. What's his emphasis here, church? Just naming a name or jumping through the Christian hoops doesn't get it, does it? Nope, you really got to let Jesus be Lord of your life, don't you? The Lord means to control. It's those who do the will of my Father who will enter into the eternal kingdom. Amen. Now this, this house built upon the rock teaching, it does apply to salvation. And if we built our, built our house uh, upon the rock of Jesus Christ, we will have eternal life. But this teaching also applies to many other, in fact, may I say, all other areas of our lives. That if we will follow Jesus' teachings about whatever area you can think of in your life, then He will give you victory in that area of your life. Just like He gives us a victory over sin and death and saves us. You can, we can apply this to any and every area. Area. Any of you, how many in here have heard of George Barna? Have you heard of George Barna? Okay. He is a Christian research analyst. And I believe he's the, the best that there is. Uh, I got to meet George and I can tell you that uh, listening to him, he's a man in love with Jesus Christ. He's a man who knows and believes in the Word of God. And his ministry, what he's been called to, is to find out what is really going on in the churches and society, but mostly in the churches. So what he does is, him and, him and uh, those who work for him, for two years they travel across America. And then uh, the questioning uh, people in churches, questioning believers mostly, but also questioning unbelievers, find out what they believe about this and that, find out how they're living, find out what's going on in their churches, what's going on in their families, what's going on in their lives. So he, so he uh, does all this research, uh, then he comes home, and then he puts all of that information together, and then he, then he puts out a lot of reports periodically. In fact, I get every week, I get George Barna stuff, email, that uh, he'll take some topic and he'll look at all the research that they've done. And, uh, and, and show what people believe on this or that or what's going on in some area of society. <clears throat> now he wrote an article uh, not too long ago in the Promise, Promise Keepers magazine. Have you all heard of Promise Keepers? Uh, that was a men's ministry that uh, used to be m uh, more active, uh, but boy, God used it to change a lot of guys' hearts. I've been, uh, I've been to a few of their gatherings myself. In fact, the Promise Keepers for men had the largest gathering of pastors ever in all history. 
When I found out that was going to take place, I said, I don't want to miss out on that. I have a feeling God's going to say something to a group like that. The largest gathering of pastors in all history was down in Atlanta, Georgia, not too long ago. And God spoke. So he wrote an article uh, in Promise Keepers magazine some time ago, um, which confirmed what many church leaders already believed, already knew about the condition of today's church. Do we really want to know where the church is today and what the general church believes? I think that's important, don't you? So we're not playing games with ourselves and where the church is and, and its place uh, in society, with the, uh, whether uh, what it's doing in society. He says, Christians are becoming more and more like non-Christians. And then he named some areas. I mean, he had, you know, he interviews thousands of Christians. He said, uh, outside of the church walls, the church has generally the same percentage of, uh, of divorce rates as the non-Christians. That outside the church walls, uh, the, the uh, so, so-called Christians um, are into premarital sex just about the same as non-Christians are. The use of pornography is just about the same amongst church people as it is amongst non-Christians. Burdensome debt is just about the same amongst so-called Christians as non-Christians. Many who are in the churches, he found out, are still drinking, are still cussing, are still gambling and playing the lottery, are still smoking, are still lying, they're still bitter against somebody, are still full of pride. In other words, very much like people in the world. And he has shown that the result of that, of people in the church being very much like people in the world, the result is that church people are not able to bring the lost to Jesus Christ effectively. We're going to look a little bit more uh, about that. Also, because our Christians are getting more worldly, he has found that they have, and the church in general, has very little impact on the national culture. There was a day, decades ago, where presidents would call on leaders in the churches to find out what they had to say about whatever topic is in the news, about whatever the government was needing to act upon. There was a day uh, when the church was looked to for truth, for the standard on everything. There was a day the church had great influence in our nation, but it doesn't anymore. Now, many have thought the reason for that is because uh, of the worldly competition, uh, the competition between the world and the church for the people who say they are Christians. Now, you understand what I'm talking about here. Because the world um, is trying to take our time. The world is trying to take our hearts. 
claim our hearts for the things and the love of the activities and the stuff of the world. And the, and the world is drawing so strongly on the, on, uh, on the people who call themselves Christians and that many are being drawn away from that giving full service uh, to Jesus Christ and to His church. And many think that's the reason why the church has become so much like the world. They've given in. Just look at how much time we spend on stuff in the world and how much time we spend for the Lord. But what Barna had found out was that's not true. That's not the reason why uh, so many in the church are like those who are non-Christians. The real reason is because so many in the church fail to apply God's words, Jesus' teachings to the areas of their lives. That's the reason the church is becoming ineffective. Not applying His teachings to every area of life. Barna says, after all these interviews with Christians all over every few years, most Christians don't know Jesus Christ's teachings. So they can't apply those teachings to their attitudes toward this and that and the other thing going on in the world. So they can't apply His teachings to the opinions they have about this and that they read about in the news or that's going on in their lives. So they can't apply His teachings to the decisions that they make in life. They can't apply His teachings to the values that they hold because they don't know His teachings. <clears throat> I thought I'd uh, show you a little bit of this comparison between Christians and non-Christians in this uh, letter he had in, uh, in the uh, Promise Keepers magazine. Now, it, Here's what he was doing here in this area. He would ask uh, um, Christians and non-Christians this, th he would make this statement and ask uh, uh, whether they agreed or disagreed. Uh, for example, this statement, overall you are very satisfied with your life these days. So he, so he threw that statement out. And 59% of, of Christians said they are very satisfied. And 52% of non-Christians say they're satisfied. Now here's another statement he, he gave them. Freedom means being able to do anything you want. 35% of Christians said, yep, that's what freedom means. 42% of non-Christians agreed. Now, I've got a bunch of these, but I'm going to just give you a few. God helps those who help themselves. 80% of Christians agreed with that statement. 83% of non-Christians agreed with that statement. Now we're a word church here, aren't we? We, 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 we try to emphasize how important it is. In other words, you already know that that statement is not in the Bible anywhere, right? It does not say anywhere in the Bible that God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. And yet, 80% of the Christians he interviewed agreed with the statement. It's almost, in fact, that's a false statement according to the Bible. Just let me tell you that. It's almost, here's another statement, it's almost impossible to be a moral person today. 27% of Christians agreed, 33% of non-Christians agreed. You notice these percentages hang pretty close? 
Another statement, when it comes to morals or what is right and wrong, there are no absolute standards that apply to everybody in all situations. 70% of Christians agreed with that. 81% of non-Christians agreed. I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, this guy knows his stuff. He's interviewed thousands in churches. People are basically good. 79% of Christians agreed. 89% of non-Christians agreed. Are people basically good? No, we're born with, in sin, aren't we? It's been passed down through the fathers. <clears throat> Just a couple more. Does Jesus make a difference? The main purpose in life is enjoyment and personal fulfillment. 53% of, of Christians agreed. 66% of non-Christians agreed. No matter how you feel about money, it is still the main symbol of success in life. 51% of the Christians agreed. 54% of non-Christians agreed. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Two people could define truth in totally conflicting ways, but both could still be correct. 67% of Christians agree. That topic's come up with the trekkers, hasn't it, Michelle? Yeah. 76% of non-Christians agree with that about absolute truth. One more. When it comes right down to it, your first responsibility is to yourself. 41% of Christians agreed with that. 59% of non-Christians. Did that set you aback? Now these statistics aren't, aren't new. Um, in fact, I couldn't get a hold of the most recent statistics, so these are a few years old. But what I did find out was that the church has continued to become more like the world, and the statistics and the percentages are even closer now than they were when these were taken between the Christians and the non-Christians. That's the truth. That's why the church is not the cultural influence that it used to be. Our community and its families will fall apart without a strong moral and ethical influence from the church. Maybe we ought to reword that. Maybe we ought to say, our community and its families are falling apart because the church has not been a strong moral and ethical influence on them. After all, we're supposed to be salt for the culture, aren't we? And for society, aren't we? We Christians, we're supposed to be salt. That means we keep society from turning rotten if we're being the salt. And we're supposed to be the light, aren't we? What does that mean? That means we keep society out of the dark on what the truth is in all these important areas of life. Salt and light. Are we the salt and light that we once were? When non-Christians are looking for help, and they're looking for help because they're, they're suffering, they're hurting, they've got marriages in trouble, they've got financial pressures, they've, they're hurting. And when they're looking for help, most of them reject Jesus Christ for help because most of His followers fail just as much as they do. See, they're looking for someone with proven success in marriage, 
in child raising, in the finances. Now I'm talking about being rich here, success and finances. Just talking about I'm not under oppressive debt, and my God takes care of all of, all of my needs. Success. They're looking for those who have success. They found contentedness. See, they want contentedness. And they're not finding that in the Christians. Truth is, you and I know, Jesus Christ promises success in every area of life. Doesn't he? Does he leave out areas? He promises success in every area of life if we will apply his teachings to those areas of life. That's the message of the house built upon the rock. Amen? Amen. And if we will follow his teachings and he gives us success in all these areas of life, then we will become better witnesses than those non-Christians who get in trouble and are suffering, and especially those who are around you, the ones close to us, the ones that get to see you every day or every week. They know what you're like. Especially those ones, when they see success in your life, then they're much more likely to turn to Christ when the pressures are on them and they're suffering and hurting. Now, it's true, sometimes we need to redefine success. I've done this a few times in messages lately. For example, what is success in the family, a family with kids? How would you describe success there? What would the world say? Well, the world would say, just get them a good education, Get them on the sports team, maybe even the traveling team. Give them a nice house to grow up in. Get them a good education so that they can get a good job and make good money and buy a now nice house in a nice neighborhood with a couple of vehicles and they'll be able to go on nice vacations and get a good pension and retire early and enjoy life. Isn't that the world's definition of success? Well, what's Jesus' definition of success? What is his teachings on success about the family and raising kids? Train up a child in a way that he should go, and when he's old he shall not depart from it. Jesus wants us to raise up children who are separated from the world, not like the world. Children who live holy lives. Children who are not ashamed to bring up Jesus Christ. Children who can be used of God to stand up for the truth in difficult situations. And if we can raise children who become soldiers of Christ, Christian veterans, then we will have been successful with our families. Too many Christians are following the world's definition of success and not, and not Jesus' teachings. This principle in the house built upon the rock parable is applicable to every area of life. Let's take one area and look at this parable again. And, and use that area. And the, now let's choose um, a well-known, how about marriage, okay? You're not going to get mad at me, are you? <laughs> let's apply this teaching to marriage. Verse 24, let's go back here. Anyone who listens to my teaching, now who's teaching here? And follows it, is wise. Sounds like David opening up worship with his sermon, with his uh, scriptures. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. 
Okay, so we're looking at marriage through this principle of listening to what Jesus teaches about marriage. And if, if we'll follow those teaches, teachings about marriage, then that marriage will be solid, right? Isn't that what he's saying here? So, um, does Jesus say anything about marriage? Does he teach anything about marriage? Does he? A little bit? I'm probably, God's been laying it on my heart to, to uh, spend some time on that very topic, probably coming first of the year. Uh, I've uh, done series on the family before. Uh, last time I did one, it took nine weeks. And I didn't even come close to bringing up all the scriptures that I'd gathered on the family from the scriptures. Didn't even come close. For example, do you, do you know in Jesus' teachings, um, Actually, Jesus using Paul in the letter to the Ephesians chapter 5. Do you know what Jesus teaches about um, the husband and what he needs from his wife more than anything else? Does that sound like something that's important? <laughs> Is that some teaching you need to know and that wives need to know? What does your husband need from you, according to Jesus' teaching, more than anything else? You know what it is? Respect. Number one, he needs your respect more than anything else. And you might say, well, I'm not so sure he deserves my respect. I mean, yeah, I've seen the dumb decisions this guy's made. That doesn't matter, does it? Follow the teachings. And do you know, fellas, do you know what wives need more than anything else from you? Do you know what, what Jesus says? Love. Got it right, huh? <laughs> love. So, guys, it's not just saying I love her or even be willing to say that in front of others. Your wife's got to know you love her. She's going to know it by the way you love her. Hallelujah. And that's what she needs more than anything else from you as a Christian husband. And that's just two things. Just apply those two teachings to your marriage. And that'll work toward success in the marriage. All right, where are we here? Verse 25. If you'll do that, apply his teachings on marriage, though the rain comes in torrents, and the flood waters rise, and the winds beat against that house, that marriage, it won't collapse because it is built on the bedrock of Jesus' teachings. What, what do you think the rains might be that come against a marriage? The rains. I think, I think the rains here symbolize those normal troubles that come against every marriage. Every marriage, you know, it, it has normal troubles that it has to deal with, right? How about the floods? What do you think the floods symbolize here? I think the floods are the crises that every marriage will face. Crises don't happen that much, but boy, when these troubles hit, they are heavies. And then the winds. And then he bring up winds here. And when the winds beat against that marriage, it won't collapse. What do you think these winds symbolize? I know one thing it symbolizes is the bad advice you get, ungodly advice you get from other people. Might have been your mom. <laughs> Or the, or the people you work with, or the ones you grew up with, or somebody at the university teaching on marriage. Bad advice. Those are winds. What else might be uh, the winds that will be attacking, that attacks every marriage? The fads of society. 
Now, see, society keeps changing what they say about marriage, don't they? All the time. In fact, they want to re redefine it completely. And those, if you want to listen to the winds of this changing society, then you're in big trouble. You're going to apply those to your marriage. 26. Anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. Now you all can picture putting, built, putting that house up on sand, right? And, and getting the, the rains we've been getting lately. <laughs> it isn't going to stand too well. <clears throat> so, Jesus is talking about those who have heard His teaching on marriage, but don't obey it. We're talking about fools here, according to what Jesus says. So these, these are the people who might say, uh, I know what Jesus says about marriage, but it's just too hard. That will take a lot of work to work on all of that in my marriage. Or they might say, hey, we've never done it that way, my husband and I. I'm, I don't think we can do that. Or they might say, you know, yeah, I heard the teachings of Jesus, but my spouse won't do it. And if my spouse won't do it, I'm not going to do it either. Or they might say, I have my personal reasons for I, why I can't follow Jesus' teachings in, in my marriage. You don't know what a hard upbringing I had and what my family life was like growing up. I have my personal reasons. Others might say, I can't follow Jesus' teachings on marriage because those people sitting across the aisle from me at church, they don't follow them. Others aren't following them, so why should I have to follow them? And that's why their marriages fail. And so they have a joyless marriage. And so they have a miserable marriage. They don't even like hanging out with their spouse. And so that leads them to dead end lives as far as marriage is concerned. And for some, it might even end up in divorce. In fact, I believe that's where Becky and I were heading at one time early in our marriage. I was not a good husband. She did not clearly know that I loved her, as Jesus' teaching said, because I liked hanging out with the guys. The pub was my hangout. I probably spent more time with Tommy than I did with Becky. <clears throat> I put a hole in the wall one time I got so angry at her. I was not a good hubby. But bless God, Jesus chased Becky and I down and tackled us and saved us and started teaching us about marriage. What are my roles as a husband in the marriage? What are her roles as a wife in the marriage? And you know what? They aren't the same. Hmm. And he, so he started teaching us. And he has, through his teachings, and Becky and I applying those, he has made our marriage strong. And there are not any rains, floods, or winds that's going to blow it down. We're going all the way together. Amen, Beck? The devil's not going to be able to do it. Hallelujah. How about your marriage? Amen. But it wasn't just in this marriage area that uh, God's, Jesus' teachings has helped Becky and I out. Because uh, the way we handled our finances before we got married were stupid. <laughs> it 
I just, that's just, we had no wisdom at all, no teaching at all hardly with, with uh, how to handle finances. Some of you may not have been Christians, but at least you, somebody taught you a little bit of principles about how to handle your finances. But we got Jesus' teachings on it, the Bible teachings. It turned our finances around. We don't owe one penny anywhere. Nowhere. I believe that's what the Word says. Except on things maybe that increase in value, and you're pretty sure about it. <clears throat> now, we're not rich. But hey, my birthday was just here, and the kids are asking, What do you want for your birthday? I said, I can't think of anything. You know, I've got everything I want, and I'm pretty happy. I'm a contented guy. So they got to work hard to come up with, with gifts for, for old Pappy. <laughs> That's following Jesus' teachings. That brings success. And if we really believe in Jesus Christ, we will desire to follow wholeheartedly what He teaches because we will know that our house won't fall, and that, that this area of our, these different areas of our lives will be successful. We will be blessed in all these areas that we apply Jesus' teachings, if we really believe. And then He'll give us joy. And then we'll be better examples for those around us who need help. Because they'll say, whoa, there's a successful marriage. Whoa. You know, Beck and I have relatives been hanging around us a long time, and they get some financial pressure sometimes, you know. And uh, so they'll say, Beck and Mick seem to be doing all right there. Maybe I ought to ask them. And then we can tell them, hey, Jesus will tell you what to do with your finances. And then we Try to be used of him in that area. See, we know following Jesus' teachings will bring success. And I don't stutter when I say that. I can say that confidently. I don't care what area you bring up in your life. If you follow Jesus' teachings, he will give you success there. Somebody say amen. amen. We don't have to stutter when we say that, do we, church? No. Amen. Amen. Why? Because Jesus backs up what he teaches. So he'll help, he'll help us defeat the devil in whatever, what, whatever area he's trying to attack us. And what does the devil try to do? Kill, steal, and destroy, right? Jesus brings life. So, does Jesus Christ say anything about child raising? Does he say anything about business or how you are to act on the job? Does he say anything about how you are supposed to treat your neighbors? Does he say anything about how to handle your money? Does he say anything of how, about how to treat your enemies? Does he say anything to the church about how to be successful in his eyes? Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you need success in any of these areas that's been brought up this morning? Do you need to find out what Jesus has to say and what He teaches about some of these areas that have been brought up this morning? How about your marriage? How about your kids? What's your definition for success for your kids? Do you need to obey Jesus in some other area of your life? And I know that even as I'm saying this, some are sitting in here and they're thinking, it's just too tough. I've just been doing it the other way, my, this other way too long. It's just too tough. Now let me close by 
looking at Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, a scripture everybody in here should know, and we'll apply it to this teaching today. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Does that apply to every area of life? I can do everything through Christ. Raise those kids, work on that marriage, change these finances, drive my car out in the community. I can do it the way Jesus wants me to and stay out of, out of more accidents that way. Huh, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> For example, I always like to say, <clears throat> you're, you know you, you have a personal angel. I, I believe that with all my heart. But I don't think he'll go over the speed limit. So you go over the speed limit, he's back there at 55 mile an hour. You know? <laughs> Would you bow your heads with me? The house that's built upon the rock Holy Spirit, bring to our minds, place it on our hearts, the areas that we need to obey you in better. Show us what you have to say, how, how. We're to operate in these areas of our life so that you can give us success, so that you can use our lives as examples to witness and reach the lost and bring them to you so they can be saved from their troubles. What area is God bringing up to you today? Now, would you respond to him? If he's bringing up an area to you, and if you're polite, you would respond. Your mom taught you that, right? When someone speaks, you speak to them. Respond to God. Say, okay, Lord, let's tackle this area. Show me how, Lord, that's all I need. Show me how. I'll get in your word. I'll go to others who can teach this from your word. Just show me how. Change me. Bring me success. And bring you the glory. And whose name do we pray in? The name of? Amen. Amen. Altars open, you all know by now. There may be a need or two out here somewhere. There just might be. And you know this side is if you just want to come up, spend time with the Lord alone here. And if you come over to this side, this kneeling rail, then uh, by doing that, you're letting me know that you'd like me to pray or somebody else to pray with you. So just a reminder of that. We want to remind you every once in a while. Father, we continue to pray for Don Gibson and the hip surgery that he's going to go through tomorrow. We thank you for guiding him to this place. We thank you ahead of time for giving him success in this surgery, for changing that limp and that pain uh, to skipping down the, the aisle painlessly. Take care of him, Lord. We continue to lift up the unborn child of George and Devon who has multiple severe deformities. And we thank you for the miracles in your answering prayers, getting rid of the club foot 
already and, and straightening the limbs out already and returning the baby to a normal heartbeat already. But still, there's so many, so many other deformities. We're praying that you'd continue uh, to perform miracles in this baby and use this baby as a great testimony to your love and power. We continue to pray for our veterans, past, present, and future. All of them have given some, and some of them have given all. And so we pray for them first, that you'd save those who are lost, so they can call upon you for every need, that you'd protect them, Lord, guard their minds, use them, Lord, as witnesses to other soldiers and, to the, and in the countries that they may be in or amongst the people they'll be around. We thank you for them. We have a praise, a thank you for your grace and mercy, for all the prayers, call, calls, and cards uh, for Mick and Joyce, from Mick and Joyce Mark. Mick's back today. Hallelujah. God performed a miracle on Mick. Amen and amen. Father, now we ask by your spirit that you'd show us who we need to pray for. In fact, Lord, I feel led by your spirit that we should pray for our pew pals this morning. I uh, hope that everyone here has put together a pew pal list. You know those people who sit around you in this sanctuary when you come to worship. And if they're not here, you especially want to be praying for them. So let's pray for our pew pals this morning. And for those up in the balcony, pray for your balcony buddies. Thank you for getting us here today, Lord. Continue to make you and your church a high priority, not just high, the top priority in our lives. May our lives show that to all who've been watching us and who will be watching us. Glory and praise and honor be yours forever and ever through Jesus Christ. And the believers said, Amen. Amen. All rise.